So uh, welcome all at the TCS seminar at Jagiellonian. Our speaker today is Gabor Tamajdi from Reni Institute in Budapest. So uh, Gabor just uh, defended his uh, PhD thesis. It was not even a month ago. Uh, that was under supervision of uh, Demeter Pavlogli. So, um, yeah, Gabor works mainly, from what I can tell, he works mainly in combinatorial geometry. But today, it seems he prepared for us a, a more abstract Ramsey type problem statement. Gabor, thank you. Thank you for joining us. And then the Zoom is yours. Okay, thank you. All right. So, uh, I will talk about the nice combinatorial conjecture. Uh, the motivation comes from combinatorial geometry, but it will quickly turn into an, an abstract problem. Uh, yes, I'm uh, I'm a little bit tired. Uh, so if if you don't understand what I'm if if I'm not me like if the sentences are not uh, comprehensible, then stop me and ask questions, please. Um, all right. So my my main goal is to is to present a, a conjecture. It's it's a new conjecture, uh, just like two years old, and uh, I want to convince you to work on this conjecture because I think this is a very nice conjecture. Um, so as I said, the motivation comes from combinatorial geometry. Uh, so here there was a, a problem in American Mathematical Monthly. Uh, so the problem won't be very interesting for us, but the solution. Uh, one of the solutions will be the interesting part. So this was the question, problem 1,251. Uh, so if you color uh, the points of the plane with two colors, is it true that we can always find a unit area convex pentagon with all vertices of the same color? Okay, so, so let's see a solution for this problem. It's a solution by Walter Stonequist. Uh, he said that, um, yes, the answer is, of course, yes. And uh, and it's enough to look at the vertices of a 31 gone. Okay, so just forget the plane. We will look at the vertices of a 31 gone. And er already among the vertices of a 30, 31 gone, regular 31 gone, we will find five that has the same color and, uh, and they form a unit area of pentagon. Of course, we have to scale scale it correctly. I will I will talk about it in a moment. Uh, um, but he said that already this will work on a thirty-one gone, and and in particular he he had the following idea. Uh, let's look at pentagons uh, that have has side lengths one, two, four, eight, and sixteen. Uh, through this talk, the distance will always be number of uh, number of steps, not not the Euclidean distance, but just number of steps. So here, this is this is one, this is two, this is four, this is eight, and this is sixteen. Okay, uh, and he said that okay, we have the thirty-one gone, and look at all the pentagons that have that has these side lengths, and the order doesn't matter. So so here is another example. Here we have one. To uh, four here, eight and sixteen. Okay, let's look at all the pentagons that look like this. Uh, the, the sides must be different powers of uh, of two. Okay, and <clears throat> it's not hard to see that all these pentagons uh, have uh, have the same area, uh, and the reason for that is is very simple. Uh, you can express the area of these. Uh, or, or, I mean, in general, it works though. If you have a cyclic polygon, the area only depends on the length of the sides, not on the order of them. So in general, what you can do, you you connect the vertices to the midpoint, and then you get these triangles. The area of these triangles only depend on the on 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 the length of this arc, and then the area of this pentagon is gen is is going to be just a uh, some of these areas. Uh, well, we have this very thin triangle, so we have to subtract because 
because the midpoint is uh, is uh, is not inside the pentagon because we have this long size of uh, of tank 16. Okay, so the area doesn't depend on the order of the of the sides. If if the sides are one, two, four, eight, and sixteen, the area will always be the same. So we can scale the thirty one gone such that all these pentagons have the same area. And then he said, okay, these are all unit area. Now we only have to show that one of them will be monochromatic. Yes. So, <clears throat> so his solution was that, uh, okay, look at this 31 gun. And he claimed that no matter how we color it with two colors, we will find five of them with the same color uh, with this property that the, the size names are one, two, four, eight, and 16. Um, and he simply checked all the cases with the computer. So, so he didn't do anything fancy here. He, he wrote the computer program to check all the cases. Okay, and, and from now on, we can forget about the geometric background. This solves the original question, but he immediately made the conjecture, does this, does this work in general? Uh, if I'm not looking at a 31 gun, uh, but, but a bigger number, is this gonna work or not? So, Yes, yeah, so he just checked all the cases with the computer and and uh, and made this conjecture that I've written here. Uh, so so <clears throat> there there are two ways to think about it. Uh, one way is that we color the vertices of a of a two to the k minus one gun, and we want to to find a, a k gun with distances one to up to two to the k minus one. Uh, or another way to think about it is that we, we color the wall circle, like we color every point of a circle, and we look at look for a k-gon where the length of the arcs are proportional to these numbers. I will sometimes it will be more convenient to talk about it one way or the other way. Uh, I hope this won't be confusing. Okay, so he made this conjecture, and uh, so when I first heard this question, my, my initial reaction was like, what the hell? What is this conjecture? Like, yeah, this is well, like, this is very unusual. Uh, we take all these permutations, uh, we get these powers of two. Uh, so this is either gonna be uh, trivial or, or it's not gonna be true. My feeling was that this is something completely unreasonable. So my goal is to convince you that this is something uh, which is really a reasonable conjecture. Okay, so why powers of two? Uh, so we couldn't solve this conjecture, but we could we could uh, show something very surprising. Uh, so this is joint work with Demeter Pavlody and Spock and Nora Franco. Uh, we showed that if we take some other numbers, not the powers of two, this theorem will not work. Okay, so so take any any set of of other other numbers. Uh, there will be a two coloring of the of the circle such that there is no kagon with this given proportions. Okay, so uh, excuse me. So here you are looking at kagon, which is the same k. I, I don't think it's the same k that in two to the power k minus one, right? Yeah, yeah. So, 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 just, uh, so, 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 just take any set of numbers. Uh, I don't know d one up to d k, and look at uh, look look at the the regular uh, sum of the eigen, and and we color the vertices of that. So, it's the a statement would be I don't know. If I take one, two, and five, is it true that if I two color the vertices of an eight gone, there will be always three uh, with 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 distances one. Uh, Aha, so, one, so one, two, five. So the number of vertices is the sum of these uh, uh, yeah. sidelines. Okay. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what I, yeah. So the number of, number of vertices is just the sum of these uh, numbers. And and another, like this formulation is more like a, a geometric formulation is that I color the vertices of a, of a circle and then I'm looking for arcs where the, where the ratio is of these arcs is proportional to the given numbers. Uh, this is sometimes more natural because of course, if I, if I if I would give numbers, uh, I don't know, two, four, and eight, the theorem would hold for these ones because every distance just doubled compared to to one, two, and four. So, so that's why it's uh, it's better to talk about proportions uh, than than the actual numbers. Okay, so is is the statement clear for everyone? There's a good moment to check. Okay, so so we claim that nothing else works. Um, uh, only the powers of two. So so like the distances must be doubling if we order them. Okay, uh, but for the for the original, uh, yeah, and and we will in fact show that. Uh, there is a uniform two coloring. I will explain what's a, what is a uniform two coloring in a moment. And for the original conjecture, we we could not solve or, uh, or decide in any way. We verified it for up to k equals seven. Uh, and and how did we verify it? Well, it's uh, it was a it, there is a straightforward way to to write a write the soft formula for this. So if you think about it, this is just a two coloring question on a hypergraph. Uh, we have our set of vertices and we take some of the k tuples, those are the edges of the hypergraph, and we want to decide whether this hypergraph is two colorable or not. And then we can just write a, a, a formula which which asks, is there a two coloring for this uh, for this hypergraph? So this is a this is the usual way of, of turning a coloring question into a formula. Uh, uh, we take we take all the edges of the hypergraph, and and for each vertex we have a variable which indicates do I color this red or do I color this blue, and then the conditions of of two coloring the hypergraphs are very simple. Uh, this part just says that every edge should contain a red vertex, every edge. Should contain a red vertex, and then this other part says every edge should contain a blue vertex. So, so if there is a, there is so so there is a two coloring if and only if there is a solution to this uh, to this formula, and we can fit this formula into our favorite soft solver, and and it will compute whether it's uh, it is satisfiable or not. Uh, so this is exactly what we did, and and this works up to up to k equals seven. For uh, it took probably half an hour for k equals seven. Uh, for k equals eight, I I run my computer for uh, one hundred days, and it did not come to a conclusion uh, in one hundred days, and then I gave up. So the problem is that the the complexity of this problem uh, explodes as k increases. We have exponentially many vertices. So we have double exponential uh, number of colorings. Uh, and already for k equals eight, we have 255 variables and two and a half million closes in this formula. So the computer could not handle this. Um, yes, and <clears throat> this is a theoretical, uh, Computer science uh, place. I should mention a little. There is this interesting question: How quickly can we even check uh, a solution? So, say somebody says that I have a counter example for k equals ten. Uh, it gives you a coloring on a thousand vertices. Uh, I, I think it's. I, I don't have any method to check whether this coloring is actually a counterexample to the conjecture or not. Because if, uh, I don't know, if we have k plus 10, 
then the number of uh, number of um, pagans that we have to check is uh, is two to the k minus one times k minus one factorial. And okay, maybe we can do this for k plus ten, but k equals twenty definitely we cannot go through all the edges. Uh, so so if you can if you could figure out a, a, an efficient way to test a coloring whether it's a counter example to the original question or not but that would already be interesting at least for me um okay so now <clears throat> i want to talk about let me go back here i want to talk about the proof of this theorem that nothing else works uh, and and it starts with something seemingly completely different. Okay, uh, it starts with another problem. Uh, interestingly, it's also appeared in American Mathematical Monthly uh, roughly hundred years ago. It's problem three thousand one hundred seventy-seven. Uh, it was phrased differently, but uh, it will be more useful to to look at this formulation of the problem. Uh, some of you might know this. This is something that uh, that is uh, a little bit famous. Uh, there are uh, many papers about this result. So, so this problem said that uh, um, if you have two positive numbers, both of them are irrationals, such that they satisfy this condition that the reciprocals sum up to one, then these two sequences. Uh, partition uh, the 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 integers the partition the natural numbers so so what does this mean uh, so this is here is just an arithmetic sequence uh, we take multiples of, of one of the numbers and then we take the floor of this number and the second one is uh, similar with it to the other number and um, and this is connected to, to a lot of interesting math. Uh, for example, it's connected to a combinatorial game called Bithops name. Uh, so so uh, let me just quickly scratch it, sketch it. Uh, so you can play this game, but you have two bags and there are some rocks in it. And it's a two player game. In each step, you are allowed to take any number of rocks from one of the bags, or or you can take the same amount of rocks from both of the bags. Okay, so for example, if we have three and two rocks in them, I can move to to two to one to zero to. Well, I can also move to. Uh, to one taking one from both, and I, I can also move to one zero, and I can also take from the other one, three one, and three zero. These are my my moves from here. And and the game is the usual. If you cannot make a move, if you get to zero zero, uh, so if you get zero zero and you cannot make a move, then then you lose. And and you could ask which. Which pairs of numbers are, are are winning positions? So if you leave, like if you leave zero and zero stones, then you win. The other one cannot move, and and you win. Uh, if you if you leave one and two, then you will then you will win again because uh, the other player will uh, move to a position from which you can move to zero zero. But he cannot move to zero zero, and and the next one is uh, in three and five, and and so on. So you you could you can ask what positions are the winning positions, and it turns out, uh, and this is very surprising since this is a combinatorial game. Um, nothing, there is nothing irrational in it, uh, but it turns out that the winning positions are are. Uh, are are sequence like like this problem. So so the winning position is like mm 
where where this is the golden ratio. You mean that's the full characterization of the unique positions? Uh, yes, and also the yeah, it's symmetric, so also the other way around. Sure. Yes. Ah. Oh. Wow. So this is the full, full characterization of the meaning positions. And it somehow goes back to this problem, the, uh, or it's it's uh, connected. So for example. So I have uh, a question to the original problem. So you say that this partitions natural numbers, but if I imagine, let's say, alpha 1 to be a, um, yeah, so be a very large number, like I don't know. Uh, then, then it then the floor of this number times one and this number times two is is the same is the same like zero. So it's a it's a it's a multi set then, yeah. That partitions or what? How should I read it? Uh, let me let me let me see. I might have made a mistake here. Alpha one and alpha two is always greater than one. Ah, oh. thank you. Okay. Oh yes, 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 yes. This yeah. could actually work. Wow. Yeah. So. So here, I think we have for the golden ratio. I didn't check this, but I think we have something like this. Or this equals one. Uh, so we can, by this theorem, we will, for example, see that. Uh, uh, this might not be true, but okay. So this is not very important. It, I'm I'm just pointing out there is a very nice connection here to to some some game game theory things, uh, and. And this is very surprising. Like this is a completely combinatorial game, and then in the solution we must use uh, irrational numbers. Uh, okay, so 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 this because of this nice theorem and and connection to other things, there are a lot of research on these sequences where we take a where we take a arithmetic sequence and we take the floor of it and and look at what integers we get. Uh, and in general, there are many generalizations. Oh yeah, I wanted to mention that these are known as uh, Betty sequences. Well, they were already already mentioned by Rayleigh earlier. So sometimes the, this theorem is sometimes called Betty Rayleigh theorem. And and one of the generalizations that people looked at is a is a is a very natural generalization of the previous statement. What happens if we look at uh, general arithmetic sequences, though, we are allowed to ship the sequence by some beta warrior. So if, again, we take integer multiples of a number, but well, it might start somewhere else, not at zero. And and we can ask uh, when such a, when such sequences partition the integers. Okay, so let let me use some notation. For this sequence, I will use uh, B alpha beta. And, and we can ask, this is a general question, uh, for which alpha and beta values do these partition the integers? The previous statement was about k equals two when we have two sequences. There was this nice condition on, on the alpha values. So, uh, when k equals two and the betas are zero, and we have this nice condition of the on the alphas that the sum of the reciprocals should be one. Okay, um, just to just to explain it again, uh, what 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 is what this question is really about? We we take two arithmetic we take k arithmetic sequences. Uh, so here red is one of them, and blue is the other one, and we take them between the floor and and we ask when does that happen not between 
every consecutive integer, there should be exactly one from these sets. Okay, so, so these sequences partition the integers if 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 this property holds. So I I take these sequences and between any consecutive integers, there should be one uh, number from from these sequences. Yeah, and um, so the k equals two case is uh, well understood. For k larger than three, uh, the question is wide open. Frankel uh, made a nice conjecture, and this is the conjecture that he made. So, so I, I emphasize k is at least three, and and then he conjectured that if these sequences partition the integers, then the alpha values must be these values. And now we can already see that this might be connected to the original question. These, these values here are the same that showed up in the original question. So, so if you order the alpha values, they should be, and we have k sequences, they should be two to the k minus one divided by two to the i minus one, that i runs from one to k. So th these are the same values as the, the ratio of the sides with respect to the total number of points in the original conjecture. Okay, so, so clearly this is somehow connected to the original question. And now I will explain, explain the connection. Uh, oh yeah, so I, uh, before that, I wanted to mention that this is also open uh, oh, and known only for K up to seven. Uh, the original conjecture that I explained also known up to K equals seven. So I think the reason why we have K equals seven in both cases, because the complexity again explodes after K equals a seven and the computer cannot handle this. So, so for Frankel's conjecture, uh, they also use the computer to prove the K equals seven case. And they couldn't progress further. Okay, so what is the connection between these two seemingly completely different problems. Uh, so we will look at uniform colorings. A uniform coloring of, of, the, of the circle is just, I, I take some t volume, t is an integer, and I divide the circle into two t arcs, and I color them alternatingly. And then I use this to get a coloring for my uh, two to the, for my end gone. So if I want to color an end gone, I can just put it on the circle somehow. And for each vertex, I take the color uh, from this uniform coloring. Okay. So I call these uniform colorings. Uh, and I claim that already one of the uniform colorings will give us a good two coloring. So one of these, for, for one of the T's, if I do this coloring, I will get a coloring such that any k gone with the given distances will, will have good colors in it. Okay. Uh, so, so let's assume that this is not true. Let's assume that no matter how I pick T, this coloring will contain a monochromatic K gone with the given distances. Uh, so this is a very symmetric coloring. So I can assume that I have a I have a red monochromatic K gone for for each T. Uh, and now what I will look at is uh, is how these sides can be positioned on on this image. So so let's say T is one of the distances. Uh, that I'm looking at now, let's, let's say that D, D is the length of this arc. Uh, okay, so I will assume that the circle has, has unit uh, perimeter, and let's say I have, I have a side length, uh, which is D in this case, I mean, along, along the circle. And, and what I will ask, how many, how many of these blue, uh, blue intervals does this segment jump over? 
Okay, so if I increase T, uh, but I have the same segment, uh, there will be more and more blue intervals that it jumps over. Okay, and I claim that even though I don't know the position of this uh, of this segment, I can still determine the number of blue intervals it jumps over. And it's not very surprising. So, so if I have unit perimeter, then every small interval here, the red and blue intervals have have length one over two t because I have two t intervals. And if and if I make a jump of of length d here, then I will jump over uh, d times two t of these intervals roughly. Okay, uh, I roughly jump over this many intervals, half of them will be blue. So roughly, I jump over d times d blue intervals. And uh, I won't do the calculations with a, with a small case analysis. It's very easy to say, see that I will actually jump over d times d, run it to the closest integer number of blue intervals. I denote it like this. So this is d times d rounded to the closest integer. Uh, so, so a small calculation tells me that if there is a monochromatic red Kagon, then, and it has a, a side with length d, then it must jump over this many blue words. Um, this many blue intervals, okay? And now I just want to use the fact that uh, my my, uh, my Kagon goes around. So it, it must jump over every blue interval. So in particular, we have T blue intervals and we get this equation. So if, if the DIs are, are these distances that are specified, uh, I get this equation. Okay, and this holds for any t. If you assume that uh, for any t there is a monochromatic red gone, then this should hold for, for any t. Okay, and now I want to work from this equation. I want to use this equation to connect to the to the to Betty sequences, uh, and it's not very hard to do. So, so the first thing that we do is uh, this holds for any t. So I can write it for for t. I can also write it for t minus one, and subtract the two equations from each other. Okay. Uh, so on the right side, I get t minus t minus one. I get one on the right side. On the left side, I get the summation. Uh, and and the summation is very nice. Uh, I wrote it here again. Why this is very nice? Well, this is t times d i run it to the closest integer minus t minus one times d i run it to the closest integer. This is obviously a positive integer. These are integers, and the second one is smaller uh, or equal. So I get on the left side I have a sum of positive numbers on the right side, uh, the sum of non-negative numbers, and on the right side, I get one. That means that all of these terms should be zero, uh, but except, except, except for one, one should be one. Okay, uh, so we, for every t, uh, what we get is that there should be one di, uh, where this is one, and for the other ti's, uh, for for the other di's, it should be zero. Okay. Uh, so this exactly this already shows how we will get the partition of the integers. So, so this for every t there is a there is exactly one i where this happens. So I will just partition using this i value for each t. Uh, there is an i, so I can I can collect the t's by uh, by this i value. 
for which t is, is this equal to one uh, for, for the d1, for which t is this equal to one for d2, and so on. Okay. Now, let's look at, let me draw a picture here. Oh. So we want to analyze this quantity. When is this equal to one? Uh, I will just write the integers here. And then let's say uh, these jumps represent uh, moving by the eye. So every, every jump here is is of length di. And then um, and then we can ask if if I fix i uh, and look at these jumps, when will this uh, be equal to one? Well, this will be equal to one where the rounding rounding uh, moves by one. So so I run to, round to the closest integer. And if this changes, uh, I have to run to the next integer, then this changes by one. And uh, well, this happens exactly when I jump over one of the places where the rounding function changes. So these are the, the places uh, between the integers. So, so these are the numbers of the form n plus one half. If if this if the t times di sequence jumps over a number of this form, then then I get a change in the in the rounding. Then this term will be equal to one. And well, when when does this happen? We can we can simply calculate that this will happen exactly when when t is in the in this sequence. Uh, well, n plus one half divided by di. Uh, and we take the floor. So this is just how many steps we have to take to get to one of these midpoints. And now we we arrive at the at the connection between the two problems. Uh, because here we get a, a Betty sequence with parameters one over di and uh, and uh, one over two di. Okay, so again, what we did. Uh, we looked at these colorings, and if for each t there is a monochromatic Kagon, then we write up some equation, and from that we derive that certain Betty sequences partition uh, the integers. Uh, and then, uh, and then, <clears throat> and then this question turned into to a, a to this question of when do Betty uh, sequences partition the integers. So in particular, this is a special case of Frankel's conjecture. Uh, we can ask when does this happen? Okay, and, and let me emphasize, this is just a necessary condition. Uh, so, so if we claim that these uniform colorings will always uh, contain a monochromatic Kagan, and for that, this is necessary that these petty sequences partition the integers. Okay. So we went from, from, from a combinatorial conjecture, we went to a number theoretical conjecture. And now I want to go back, I want to go back to a combinatorial uh, problem. Um, so, so this partitioning into Betty sequences connected to a notion of balanced sequences. Uh, so I will quickly explain that if I have such a partition, how to turn it into something called a, a balanced sequence. And, and as I explained, such a partition uh, means that I take these arithmetic sequences, for example, here's this red arithmetic sequence, uh, here's this blue arithmetic sequence, and and they partition the integers if if there is exactly one dot between any consecutive integers. So what I can do, I can just write uh, for each consecutive uh, integers, I can just write 
which sequence uh, gives me a value between those two. So for between zero and one, uh, I get a red dot. So I write one. I write one for every red dot. Between two, between one and two, I get a, a blue dot. I write two for every blue dot. And this way, I can make a sequence. So if I have a partition, I can turn it into a sequence. It's like taking an inverse in some sense. So I ask uh, which which of these sequences gives me a, a gives me number i. Okay, and these sequences have have some very nice properties. Uh, so they are balanced sequences, which means that if I take two sub sequences, consecutive, uh, so like two sub sequences of a given size, now I just pick five numbers randomly, and I pick some other five numbers. Uh, and I count how many ones, how many twos, and how many threes are in this sub sequences, they will be roughly the same. So here I have three ones in both of them. I have two twos in the first one, one two in the second one. I get zero threes in the first one and one three in the second one. I claim that these numbers will be always the same uh, up to the difference of one. So, and it's very clear why this happens. If we, if we, if we look at the red dots, the red dots form an arithmetic sequence. And since this is an arithmetic sequence, we can calculate how many red dots can fall into an interval of given size. And depending on the position of the interval, it might change by one, but not by more. Okay, and now we can ask, we can forget about the original, we can forget about the original partition, we can ask, what can we tell about such sequences? So, so again, this question stands on its own. We have a sequence of characters, let's say we have K symbols, and we only know this property that the subsequences of given size uh, contain roughly the same amount of uh, uh, symbols for each, for each symbol. Uh, we get the same number of occurrences in the two uh, sub, sub parts. Okay. Um, and, and not very surprisingly, again, we get a conjecture where our favorite numbers show up. So, so if we have a balanced sequence, uh, we can, uh, so I won't go into the details, but we can define the density of each symbol. Uh, it's, it's not hard to see that these sequences will always be periodic. And we can look at a, a period. So in this example, the length of the period is seven. And, and we can say that the density of a given symbol is just the number of occurrences in one period. So here, one has density uh, four over seven, two has density uh, two over seven, and three has density one over seven. And we can ask if we have a balanced sequence, what can we tell about the densities of the symbols? And again, we get a conjecture. This is uh, from Altman, Doria, and Corby. Uh, they conjecture that these densities should be our favorite numbers, two to the i minus one divided by two to the k minus one. The same numbers show up again. Uh, um, again, this is a conjecture which is open. Uh, he, this implies Frankel's conjecture. So if we could solve this conjecture, it would imply the Frankel conjecture immediately. Uh, and again, this is known up to k equals seven. And but we are in luck because there is a special case of this conjecture which is solved. So so this special case uh, is written here. Uh, the theorem holds in a special case where where we have a condition 
so it's easiest to show in this example. In this example, I have this interval one and one, uh, interval starting with one and ending with one, and there is nothing in between. I have this other interval starting with two, ending with two, and all these smaller numbers in between. And I have this interval here, uh, three and three, and only smaller numbers in between. So let's say that uh, we order the symbols by densities, and we have this property that for each each symbol, we can find two occurrences such that between them, there are only symbols with, with bigger densities. So if this condition holds, then, then the densities must be uh, our favorite numbers. And, and it's not very hard to show that in our special case, so this special case where, uh, where, there, where the beta values are just half of the alpha values, in, in this case, this condition points. It's not, not very hard to show. Uh, uh, well, I will skip again the details. So this is this is the end of the proof. So we, we started with the original conjecture. We turned it into Frankl's conjecture in a special case, which we turned into a balance sequence uh, where we have some partial results in the special case. And it's not very hard to see that the conditions of this special case are satisfied. Uh, so the densities must be these numbers. And if the densities are these numbers, not hard to show that uh, the D values must be again these numbers. And then we get back the statement that we wanted to prove. Okay, uh, there was a lot of hand waving, but I, I just wanted to convey the general uh, strategy that we use. Okay, so I think all three of these conjectures uh, are very interesting and, and worth looking at. Um, so, so there are just a couple of things that I want to mention in the end. Uh, one thing we can ask, okay, these uniform colorings, they, they are very simple colorings. They already uh, show that uh, only these uh, powers of two can work, uh, but but is it true that if we take a uniform coloring, uh, this will not be a counterexample to the original question? So so we only this was only a necessary condition that we used here, not a sufficient one. So it could be that for large enough k one of these uniform colorings will be a counterexample to, to Stonequist conjecture. And we couldn't, we couldn't solve this. Uh, okay, I, I, I think I will just skip uh, the details of this one. It's not very interesting. Uh, another nice question is, that we can ask, maybe this problem is a density problem in the sense that if I two color the circles, circle or, or two color an angle, at least half of the color, half of the points will get one of the colors. And maybe already the bigger color class will contain a monochromatic k gon. Uh, and very surprisingly, this turns out to be false. So, so we could construct the coloring, uh, which is just based on. Uh, Coloring the circle with, uh, I think it's it's just ten intervals, uh, and and in this coloring the red part is roughly nine over sixteen minus some some epsilon. Epsilon can be chosen to be arbitrarily small. So so more than half of the circle is colored with with red. Well, we can show that there is no red uh, six gone in this example. So, so this is not a density type of thing. Uh, uh, of course, we can still ask, is there a large enough proportion such that if, if we color that amount of proportion of the circle with one color, 
then we will have a monopoly monop peg on in, in, in that subset of the core all of the zip code. Yes, uh, and I want to finish uh, with a remark on this whole thing. Uh, so another way to look at this problem is really to look at it as a hypergraph. Uh, in general, we don't know much about following questions on hypergraphs, uh, especially we don't have too many nice examples that are not colorable. So, so we have many results on, on how to color things, uh, we also have examples that are hard to color, that require many colors, but most of them are uh, probabilistic constructions. Uh, in general, it's not easy to show that if we have a hypergraph, then it's not easy to show uh, that it's not colorable with certain amount of colors. So, so I think it's it's really uh, it's. If you think about this problem as a hypergraph coloring question, it, it's very interesting in the sense that, that the conjecture says that this hypergraph is not too colorable. Uh, and if, the, if this would be true, this would be a very sharp example in the sense that deleting any one of the points turns it into a two colorable hypergraph. So, so if, I, if I have, uh, this is my two to the k minus one gone. I delete one of the vertices, then I can I can just color this part red, this part blue, and and this will be a good coloring because there will be a side of length two to the k minus one, and this must go from one side to the other because it's a very long uh, side. So so this. If, if this hypergraph is not too colorable, then it's very interesting that uh, it's very it's it's barely not too colorable. Deleting any one of the vertices turns it into a too colorable hypergraph. And and in general, I think it's it, this hypergraph itself is is an interesting uh, construction. It's uh, it would be interesting to look at the properties of this hypergraph. So 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 if, if I can put the previous remarks in, in, in hypergraph terms. Uh, uh, we can look at this hypergraph, what is the size of the largest independent set? We could show that it's it's more than nine over 16 times the number of vertices. Uh, what can we improve this bound? So this was this was looking at the larger color plus. And we can find this many points in the hypergraph such that they don't spend any edge. Uh, this was the original conjecture. The chromatic number is it true that it's three? And one more small thing that I wanted to know that uh, this hypergraph is has a very interesting symmetry group. Of course, uh, we can rotate the vertices and we can reflect the image. It won't change it, but we can also multiply it by two. So what do I mean? Uh, if I number the vertices like this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, then I can reorder the vertices such that I, I write the double, double numbers. So I put two, four, six, uh, eight becomes one, uh, 10 becomes uh, three, and so on, five, and Seven. Okay, so I can reorder the vertices, and something very interesting happens. Uh, if I had a, a k on here with side lengths one, two, four, and so on, it will it will move into another k on here. Uh, and, and and it will again have the same side lengths. It will again have side lengths one, two, and four here. And the reason for this is very simple. Like the distance is double. So, so if the side lengths were one, one, two, up to two to the k minus one, they will turn into two, four, 
two to the k, but two to the k is the same as one because we are modulo two to the k minus one. So this shows that this graph has a, a non-trivial symmetry. Uh, the symmetry group is, is not just rotations and translations. It, you can also reorder things in this strange way. We get, we get back the same hypergraph. All right, uh, that was all. Thank you very much for listening.